Thank you, Sam. Morning, everybody. Uh, I am filling in for Mike this morning. I'm the, the second Ben to do so. It's kind of funny. We've got two Bens. It seems like a, a bunch of Bens in the wings ready to fill in for Mike every time that he's gone. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's my honor, my privilege to fill in uh, for him this morning. And I suppose we just had scripture reading. So kids, do you guys want to head off into the back? That's okay for you to do now. Kids, as they were talking about earlier, head on through that back door, follow the line, and they've got some fun and good stuff prepared for you this morning. So Father, we thank you once again for the privilege that we have to steward your children. Uh, they are yours. You know each of them by name. You knit them together as you knit all of us together. And as we raise them up, may we raise them up in the way that we should go, or they should go. And uh, yeah, may we teach them to love you well. So, uh, boy, it's interesting because actually referencing back to Ben H over there, Ben Hemela, uh, I have been kind of surrounded by Bens for most of my life growing up. Uh, it's kind of a popular name. I remember uh, actually throughout most of elementary school and middle school, my name basically was Ben H is how I signed my name, is how people referred to me, because there were other Bens in my class all the time. And that's how they would distinguish me from Ben Nordenson, who was Ben N, or Ben Saxton, who was Ben S, and stuff like that. And it even spilled over into like how I would sign cards to family members. And so it'd be like, hey, Grandpa, happy birthday, we love you. And my brother and sister would sign it, Zach and Sarah, and then it would be Ben H, just in case they got confused, like which family was sending the card or something, I don't know. Uh, but even after I kicked that habit, and I was like, okay, I'll just be Ben, uh, there were still Bens all throughout uh, my life. When I arrived at Moody Bible Institute and I was going to school there, I was actually part, it's really it's so weird, but I was a part of a Facebook group called the Moody Bens. And there were like 30 of us, and we would get together maybe once a year and just do like the Ben lunch or something like that. And it was like we've, we had a bunch of pictures. It's an inactive group now. But again, it was just silly. And then my last semester, while I was at Moody, on just my floor, there were four Bens. And we had to kind of keep that straight. Eventually, I was kind of unofficially dubbed Grandpa Ben because I was the oldest Ben on the floor. I would also like to think that it's because I was the wisest Ben on the floor. If you ask my roommate, he would argue it's because of how I dressed and how I acted. I don't know what that means necessarily, uh, but that's what he would tell you. And so, and I hope, I'm not trying to complain about the fact that so many other Bens, even though he's gone and I could if I wanted to, uh, like, I, that's fine. Uh, it's apparently a popular name. It's, if my math was right in my research, it's basically like one out of every 150 baby boys in the US is named Ben. Cool, that's all right. Uh, what I'm more interested in is why people name their kid Ben, or any other name for that matter. Because why we name things or people, the things that we do, is interesting. We, we take time to think it through. It's not something that we take particularly lightly, typically. And I don't know about your cases, either for the, like, the instance of your parents naming you, or if you have had the privilege and the opportunity so far to name a child yourself. But oftentimes, people spend a lot of time thinking through all of their options and picking out something that they like. It has to be something that they like probably a lot, actually. That's one of the first criteria. You have to like it, you have to like how it sounds, and we have to like the things that we associate it with. You generally don't name kids after like, a name you don't like or that reminds you of something that you don't enjoy. It typically doesn't happen. And oftentimes, our names have stories behind them, too. Uh, in my time working with Youth for Christ, one of the things that uh, my boss, Dale Kuglin, and I do when we're meeting new students, uh, if they have a somewhat less common name, one of the questions we often ask is, is there a story behind that name? And that does a couple things uh, and works really well. Number one, uh, it helps us remember the name if we have a story associated with it behind it that we know. It's like, ah, so as I'm meeting and interacting with hundreds of students each year and I see the kid and I remember the story, I'm way more likely to remember that name. Number two, there often is a story behind the name. And usually kids are very excited to share and tell it. They're like, ah, I'd be happy to tell you about the reason why my parents named me that. And number three, it's a really good, easy, non-threatening way to start to get to know their story. Because as they start to tell you their name and the explanation, the reason behind it, they're telling you things about, it's basically their backstory, it's their history. 
uh, and that through that, through learning, to, getting to know their story and learning their story and then sharing our story, ultimately we connect it into God's greater story. But YFC plug over, ultimately we humans generally take naming fairly seriously. And I bring this up because it is a central topic of our scripture that we're looking at here today in Luke chapter 1, verses 57 through 66. But it's important to note we are in verse 57, which means that there's a whole 56 verses that have happened before this. So uh, important context for us. And side note, we're probably going to be referring back to the first four verses of Luke throughout the entire book of Luke, just because it does such a good job setting up what all of this is about, why Luke wrote this in the first place. So Luke, in the first few verses, he tells us that he's writing this gospel as a trustworthy account for someone named Theophilus, which means lover of God, so that they might know for certain the things that they were taught, it says in verse 4. So in other words, we're reading a true story, a real story, a reliable account. It's important for us not to miss that. And then just summarized story context for us, the narrative of it starts out with this priest named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, who are old, old enough to the point where it's uh, unusual for them to have children, and they haven't had any kids at this point. Uh, and they've kind of considered that a lost cause. And one day, Zechariah is doing his priestly duties in the holy place in the temple, and suddenly an angel shows up and appears to him, and he says, all right, Zechariah, don't freak out. Uh, you're going to have a son, and he's going to be awesome is the, again, very condensed, summarized version of what happens. Verse, to actually elaborate on that, verse 17, talking about what this son is going to be. It says, And he will go as a forerunner before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared for him. Zechariah, don't freak out. You're going to have a son, and he's going to be awesome. That's the message of the angel Gabriel to Zechariah in that moment. And Zechariah's response, we learned, was one of skepticism, one of doubt. He asks for proof or evidence. He basically says, hey, uh, how can I know that this is actually going to happen? And Gabriel just kind of goes, how about uh, an angel told you it was going to happen? How about that for evidence that it's actually going to happen? How about someone who stands in the presence of God and was sent by him according to his decree to you as his messenger to tell you about the things that are yet to come? How about that's enough evidence that this is going to happen? But maybe that's not enough for you. Since that's not enough for you and you didn't believe me, extra evidence for you, you're going to be silent and unable to speak until everything that I've told you has come to pass. And just like that, Zechariah is rendered mute, unable to speak, and lo and behold, Elizabeth gets pregnant, and as Mike and Ben have been talking about over the past couple weeks, uh, Elizabeth ends up serving as very crucial kind of emotional and experiential support for another young lady named Mary as she's processing through a supernatural and miraculous pregnancy situation of her own. So uh, Mary, uh, after staying with her for a couple months, eventually heads back home to confront the situation that she has been presented with, and we pick things up in verse 57. Verse 57 says, Now the time came for Elizabeth to have her baby, and she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. So we don't know the exact age that Elizabeth was uh, in this scenario. It doesn't say uh, in the narrative. Uh, most conservative estimates place her probably in her 60s. So again, older than you would expect a woman to be to be having children. Uh, but whatever age it was, uh, that the, it's out of, the, out of the ordinary and the neighbors and relatives, they've heard about this. And so we, the, regarding these neighbors and relatives and all the people that have come to this, you guys, again, I don't know all of your experiences, but from what I've heard and from what I've experienced, Pregnancy news seems to travel fairly quickly through people, right? In terms of speed, it's like you tell one person and suddenly you have like four other people who are asking you if you've heard yet and none of those four are the people that you've told. Uh, but then if you trace it back, it's like they heard from the person, or like two people later from the per person that you told. So in terms of like speed, there's like the speed of light, which is ridiculously, ridiculously fast. There's like the speed of sound. And just below that, because we have to talk about it, is like the speed of pregnancy news that spreads through people. And it just flies. Or maybe sometimes you've been on, like, kind of frustrated because you found yourself on the outside of that and you hear pregnancy news and everybody else knows about it and you're like, how did I miss that? 
Uh, I actually drive some people nuts about this uh, because I tend to just kind of absorb that information and not pass it on. Uh, if pregnancy news travels at the speed of light, I'm a black hole. I just kind of and it stays with me. Um, and the people around, I've driven some people nuts because they'll be like, oh, did you hear so-and-so's pregnant? And I go, yeah. They go, how long have you heard about this? And I was like, oh, and like it was like a month ago or something like that. And they go, what, and you didn't think to like tell me about it? And I was like, no, no. And like, you're supposed to tell me these things. I'm your wife. And I go, oh, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> um, it's probably true. But. Uh, in this case, this news is spreading not just because it's a pregnancy thing and it's a really exciting and there's going to be a new life and a new person and that's super cool, but there are unique circumstances that are driving this rumor mill even faster. These are old folks. This is an unexpected pregnancy. This is a rumored angelic announcement associated with this or at least some kind of vision that Zachariah had while he was in the temple that people have heard about. He's been mute ever since, which is really weird. Uh, Elizabeth went into hiding for several months afterwards. Uh, the, there's a whole bunch of situations around this that have, like, the news has just gone far and wide fast. So now that the time has finally come, the baby has been born, people are here for it. The relatives are here, the neighbors are here. And it does say in verse 58, this is a nice part, everyone rejoiced with her. And that's kind of a really sweet picture of kingdom community and how that's supposed to happen right there. Scripture tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice and to mourn with those who mourn. Uh, and that's, it's a lovely picture of that. But even in, it's, this is actually a really important note for all of us, when you're rejoicing with people who are rejoicing or if we're mourning with people who are mourning, kind of got to know our place within that. We can overstep our bounds as we're going through people with something. And it seems kind of like that's what these people do, is they get a little bit pushy in this next verse here. Verse 59. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they wanted to name him Zechariah after his father. So to start, we see here that they're following the Levitical code regarding circumcision, the mark of the Abrahamic covenant. Again, this is more evidence, as talked about earlier in Luke, that Zechariah and Elizabeth, they're a righteous couple. They follow uh, the Torah. They, they obey the laws. And apparently, uh, it's on this same eighth day that the circumcision is supposed to happen. They're supposed to name the child. And then these neighbors and relatives who are here at this time, uh, they get a little bit excited, and they're ready to just smack the name Zachariah on that bad boy and call it a day. They're like, yeah, this is his father's name Zachariah. Uh, th this is great. And call him Zachariah. That's a good one, right? All right, let's uh, case closed. Let's be done. Verse 60, but his mother replied, no, he must be named John. And they said to her, but none of your relatives bear that name. So we see Elizabeth, she's really emphatic in her response to them. She's going, no, 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 no. We're not naming him Zechariah. We're naming him John. And I don't know, we're not told in this passage, like at this point, if Elizabeth is trying to explain to them, she's like, no, 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 no. The angel told us that we have to name him John. That's why we're naming him John. Or if, and maybe she's doing that, but they're just not believing her. They thought, think that part of the story is a little far-fetched. Or if she isn't doing that and they're just really kind of skeptical and they're looking for uh, the other input. We, we don't know exactly what the conversational dynamics are at that point. But what we do know is that they're confused. Because from their perspective, there's no reason for this kid to be named John. And to go back to what we were saying, saying about naming earlier, we all have our different reasons and factors and thought processes that go into finding a good name, a desirable name, a, a pretty name or a strong name. Back then, a good Jewish family is going to give their kid a good Hebrew name that reflects their cultural identity, but they're also going to give their kid a name that uh, reflects their family of origin, the family that they come from, their familial identity. And a really easy way to do that was to just name your child after one of your closest relatives, someone you knew. And oftentimes that turned out to be the dad or the grandfather or something like that. Uh, because it's important for us to remember with this too, last names or surnames weren't really a thing back then. Today, we understand like our family dynamics and everything because we have a last name that we associate each other with. Back then, they didn't do that. So you had to incorporate the family ties and everything into that first name as well. So that first name was kind of a big ask. So Elizabeth has come out and she's saying, yep, this miracle baby that we have is going to be named John. And all of the relatives say, that's really weird. We want a second opinion. And so they go over to Zechariah. Uh, and 
which again, I don't know about you guys, but that just seems really bizarre. And I can't think of that going super well if like baby is in mom's arms or something like that. And they're like, oh, what are you going to name the kid? And she's like, oh, we're going to name him this. And they go, oh, that's a bad idea. Uh, we don't like that. We're going to go ask somebody else. It seems a bit weird to me. I feel like in and maybe it's just my situations and context, but I imagine probably the father and mother in those cases not reacting particularly favorably to that. They'd be like, what are you doing? You, you guys don't have naming rights. We're the parents. Get out of here. Um, and Because, yeah, they, again, they've spent time thinking about this. In their case, you know, they've gotten this decree from an angel. But even in our cases, like, you know, you've had at least, you know, around nine months to think about this kind of thing. You've probably thought through the names that you like uh, and even maybe debated a little bit over the names that you want it to be. Uh, I even think of when it comes to naming pets in the family situations that I've been in. It's almost like it's British Parliament if no, no one person has specific naming rights and it's like there's all this debate over what the name is going to be. Uh, so once you finally settle on one, it's like, this is going to be their name. And someone else comes along and says, I don't like it. And you can say, well, it doesn't matter. Go away. Uh, this is what this name will be. But relatives, neighbors, they're not satisfied with this name. So they made signs to the baby's father, verse 62, inquiring what he wanted to name the son. So a note here, too. It says that they make signs to Zechariah, asking him what he would like to name the child. Uh, and as I mentioned a few weeks ago, lots of scholars think that this verse indicates that Zechariah was struck deaf as well as mute. He was rendered completely silent, because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for people to be making signs to someone if they can hear. And again, this has been going on for about nine months now. People would know if Zechariah could hear. Um, uh, and it also, the level of the discipline that he was receiving from the angel, uh, that he would be silenced not only in speech but in hearing, wouldn't be out of the question. There's some debate, not everybody agrees about it, but either way, Zechariah is suddenly approached by this group of people who are all making big signs to him about his wife over there who's trying to name the baby John or whatever. I don't know. They didn't. I don't know what level of sign language they had, but they're trying to mime and like again. It's like, hey, your wife is going to name this baby this crazy name. What do you want him to be named? And so, verse sixty-three, he asks for a writing tablet and wrote, "His name is John." And they were all amazed. So, still unable to speak at this point, uh, Zachariah, as he writes on this tablet, he responds with the finality that silences people. He doesn't respond and say, he will be called John, or I want him to be called John. He flips that tablet around, and it's done deal. His name is John. No debate, no discussion. This has already happened. It's how this works. I know how not believing or going along with what angels say goes in the past. We're going with this now. And immediately after this, oh, point with this, John, by the way, the meaning of John is God is gracious. Then verse 64, immediately Zechariah's mouth was opened and his tongue released and he spoke, blessing God. So it's at this point, everything that Zechariah had doubted about what the angel had said to him earlier in the temple has come to pass and immediately his mouth is opened, his tongue released, and he speaks. And what is the first thing that he uses his voice to do as soon as he can use it again? He praises God. The last thing he had done was express doubt and disbelief. The first thing now he does is praise God. He had some options that didn't have to be the first thing that he used his voice to do. He could have been bitter about the punishment or the discipline that he just had to endure. He had to be silent for a really, really long time. Uh, he could have been annoyed at the relatives uh, who were kind of bustling about and trying to be really nosy and really pushy about the name of his kid. But instead, having just declared that the name of his son is God is gracious, is what John means. He then praises the graciousness of the God who has answered his and his wife's prayers to have a son, even in their old age. Praises the graciousness of the God who has returned his voice to him, even after his blatant expressed doubt. Verse 65, all of the neighbors were filled with fear, and throughout the entire hill country of Judea, all of these things were talked about. All who heard these things kept them in their hearts, saying, what then will this child be? For the Lord's hand indeed was with him. So this has been a wild ride for Zechariah and Elizabeth. 
through this whole thing, but this is even from the outside in terms of entertainment value and watching everything go down for their relatives and their neighbors. This has been a wild ride for everyone around Zachariah and Elizabeth as well. Because again, this crazy situation where old couple uh, not going to suddenly become pregnant, even though that's completely unexpected, supposedly announced by an angel, husband goes mute and possibly deaf. And then after the birth, the husband can suddenly speak again and starts prophesying as we're going to look at next week uh, and saying, praising God and all these crazy things. And these, these people, they walk away from the situation, it says, in fear, uh, which is, again, this kind of like reverent, respectful, awestruck wonder. They're asking themselves, what will this child be? Or it's like, what, what kind of important person is this kid going to grow up to be? Because all the other stories that we know like this, the ones that Every good Jewish boy and girl has heard the stories of Samson's parents uh, in Judges, or uh, Abraham and Sarah with the birth of Isaac, uh, or even uh, Samuel's parents uh, in 1 Samuel. Uh, every time that stuff like this happens, the person who's born, they turn out to be a pretty important person in the history uh, of Israel and God's interaction with them. So who is this person going to be? And we, who know the story, you know, spoiler alert, we already know the answer to that question. John is important because he is the one who is called to prepare the way for the most important person ever to walk on the earth, whose mother had just been hanging out with Elizabeth mere weeks earlier, who had, whose birth has been merited a similar angelic announcement, Jesus Christ, who, by the way, his name means the Lord saves. So the Lord is gracious paves the way for the Lord saves. So as we, uh, we head out from here and we go back into our normal lives, we would probably do well to be like these people and store up these things in our hearts, to remember these stories, this story, to think on this, because it was recorded in an orderly account that we just looked at so that we, so that you, Theophilus, so that you, lover of God, can know for certain the things that you were taught. We are to trust God and believe what he says. Believe what he says about who he is, believe what he says about what he's done, and believe what he says about what he will do as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for revealing yourself to us in such a compelling and interesting way as you have through stories and trustworthy and true ones at that that have been recorded in an orderly way so that we might be sure in the things that we have been taught. Thank you for uh, the people that you use throughout Scripture, uh, the characters that they are, uh, the ways that we can relate to the humanity in the stories. Uh, and as we reflect on them, may they inspire us to a greater trust in you in the end, in a reliance on you, in who you are, on what you've done, and on what you will do. We love you, Father, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.